So I was trying to figure out what to wear today for the whole retro thing, you know, the big you know, baggy pants, or I wasn't, yeah, couldn't quite figure it out, but my, my wardrobe consultant, i.e. my 10-year-old, wasn't available to help, so, um, so be it. Yeah, so today, um, again, is one of these lectures that we could spend all term talking about retroviruses because they're so <laughs> fascinating, not just because of the diseases that they cause. I'm actually more interested in them from the molecular gymnastics that they go through in terms of replication. Um, hang on. Looks like this is the wrong. Oh, this is the 2016 one. I haven't even updated, got, got updated lecture. Let's get the right one. Let's try this one instead. That looks a little better. Try this. Is that date right? That looks like a better date. OK. <laughs> See, it was retro. <laughs> Last year's lecture. Retrovirus, retro lecture. Uh, retrovirus, retro lecture. But I just noticed there was a vaccinia question, actually, a clicker question on the next slide that we didn't talk about last time. It's like, wait a minute. That's not quite right. So uh, today we'll talk retroviruses. Next week we'll talk about the most amazing viruses that we're going to talk about all term. I always leave the best for last. Um, so we'll talk about archaeal viruses on Wednesday next week um, and the viruses of algae, which again is a whole subject in and of itself on Monday, um, particularly the Mimi viruses, the megaviruses, and all of these other kinds of things. So that's why it's switching up a little bit here. Um, retroviruses, so we talked about this way back when. These are viruses that package positive strand RNA in their virions, but have to replicate through a DNA intermediate. And so this is why David Baltimore and Howard Temin got the Nobel Prize, because they figured this whole process out. Um, and this process, and I was going to bring another one of my ridiculous books with me today, the RNA tumor viruses, these really are tumor viruses. And in fact, the original oncogenes were found because of the study of these particular viruses. Now, that was really bizarre because they were RNA viruses, but they were causing a genetic disease in cells. How the heck could that be happening? Because all the cells are using DNA. And so that was really the first indication that these viruses were replicating some really bizarre way. Uh, and Howard Temin had worked on this for years, and then David Baltimore came along, and these nasty biochemists um, kind of snuck in and published a paper at the same time as Howard Temin did. Um, Temin had been working on it for years, and David Baltimore said, oh, yeah, there's this cool thing going on, and I'll publish it at the same time. I'll get a Nobel Prize, too. Uh, so, <clears throat> of course, most of the reason that people get excited about retroviruses these days has nothing to do with those RNA tumor viruses. And it turns out those RNA tumor viruses, just like DNA tumor viruses, are actually pretty rare. Uh, but HIV and all of the immunodeficiency viruses, um, mostly non-humans, um, non-human primates, um, there's been a huge amount of study on retroviruses. And as they think and they say in the textbook, um, probably one of the best studied um, diseases or disease-causing agents, and we'll cover it in about 15 minutes, which is ridiculous. Uh, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about in terms of HIV, again, has nothing to do with the disease, nothing to do with the immunology, all of which is absolutely fascinating, uh, but it has to do with the structure, um, the fullerene cone structure on how the HIV nucleocapsid gets put together. And, Hopefully, you'll see why I'm really excited about that later on. Those of you who are in the mutant viruses from hell kind of know already. So you're a little ahead of the game on this. A um, couple of key concepts as far as these retroviruses are concerned. Uh, again, this is really at the molecular level. One is that they use tRNA primers for their genome replication, which is really bizarre and fascinating, and how on earth this could have evolved is really fascinating. Um, no good answer to that. But uh, it's an RNA primer for DNA replication. Where do you get the RNAs from? You know, a bunch of tRNAs around. Um, frame shifting, we've talked about frame shifting before. Frame shifting is also absolutely critical for replication of these retroviruses. 
There's splicing that happens here. So this is very different than the pox viruses that we were talking about last time. Don't have any splicing. Here, splicing is taking place. This should give you a bit of an indication where these guys are replicating in the nucleus. And it's all cellular splicing machinery. Um, on the other hand, what's very virus specific is this whole reverse transcription. So going from RNA to DNA, what does reverse transcription? The ACE, um, the reverse transcriptase, um, that's the enzyme that does this particular job. And it's a virus specific enzyme. Once you've done reverse transcription, now you have a DNA copy of your genome. That DNA copy of your genome is actually kind of worthless when it's out in the cytoplasm because all of the machinery for transcribing and splicing, et cetera, is in the nucleus. So you have to get that DNA and put it into the nucleus. And so that's this integration process. One of the things that happens during this reverse transcription is the generation of things called LTRs. What the heck is an LTR? It's a long terminal repeat. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so these are structures in the sequence which are actually not coded in the RNA, which is present in the virion, but they are present in the DNA once it goes into the genome. And that has to do with how the replication process takes place and where all the primers are. And we'll talk about that in considerable detail <clears throat> when we talk about the replication process. There's also this process called template switching. Um, we've talked about this a little bit already when we talked about some of the coronaviruses. Oh, by the way, anybody at the biology seminar yesterday? No? None of you? OK, one of the, this is a biology education seminar, so talking about research in biology education. One of the things that the our seminar speaker really emphasized was connections between different things. And this is kind of why I always keep mentioning you know, connections between this virus and that virus. Um, they say the expertise is really in understanding those connections. It's not so much understanding the basics, but how they're all connected to each other. And that's what we're hopefully trying to get across. Whether we're working or not, we shall see, which also reminds me that you guys get to grade me. Um, that's all your class evaluations. Hopefully, you'll get an email about that. Please fill those out. Um, the numbers are fine. I don't really care about the numbers. It's those written comments that are extremely useful. And so, yeah, the exams are horrible. I know, but you feel free to write them down. Um, and then whatever other things you do or don't like um, about the class. They're completely anonymous. I'm only going to see them after the grades are turned in. Um, so back to retrovirus mode. Uh, template switching. We talked a little bit about template switching. We talked about those coronaviruses, where you have the polymerase going along and jumping to somewhere else. It turns out that this polymerase jumping process is also what happens in retroviruses and also absolutely critical for this reverse transcription step. And hopefully you're getting the idea now, because all these bizarre things that are happening in replication, that's the molecular gymnastics that I've talked about before. The genomes of all of these retroviruses are set up in this order with the genes, gag, paul, end, absolutely horrible naming process. Uh, the pol and env actually are pretty clear, polymerase and envelope proteins. Um, GAG just stands for group-specific antigens. And those group-specific antigens are what the immune system sees. Again, antigens. And so these are the structural proteins. If you think about you know, what you're going to find in a virion, it's going to be those structural proteins which are there. Yeah? Group-specific, is that to like a certain group of retroviruses? So it's a certain group of retroviruses, exactly. And we'll get to that in, in just a second here. OK, so as usual, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the diseases. And mostly, this is the part we're going to talk about the RNA tumor viruses. Not so much HIV. We'll talk about HIV um, right at the end here. Um, a little bit more about the structure. Um, these are a little hard to see on here. Maybe if I turn the lights down a little bit. These are some of these enveloped virions with these really curious structures on the inside. Um, a little bit hard to see here, but the basic take home message here is that these are enveloped with a nucleocapsid um, on the inside. Uh, entry, pretty straightforward. 
um, fusing at the plasma membrane, releasing the nucleocapsid. The replication, again, reverse transcription, this is the really important part, that's why he puts it in red. Um, and then transcription is all cellular because that's all what's happening now in the nucleus after you've had integration that takes place and assembly and export are again are pretty straightforward. So getting to Ian's question about the group specific antigens, um, these are some of those groups. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of retroviruses. Uh, usually when people think retroviruses, they immediately say, oh, it's HIV. But HIV was only discovered well after most of these other retroviruses were discovered, and particularly this one, um, Rouse sarcoma virus. This was that RNA virus that was infecting chickens and giving them cancer. It's like, wait a minute, RNA virus giving cancer, but everything is DNA. And so Peyton Rouse, who'd studied this for literally decades, uh, was really the first one to think about some of these things. And then it was Howard Temin who came along later and said, oh, this is in fact um, because of this reverse transcription process that's taking place. But if you look at all of these ones before we get down to these immunodeficiency viruses, tumor virus, leukemia virus, leukemia virus, sarcoma virus. So all that are causing these various different tumors. And again, much later, it was these immunodeficiency viruses. And in fact, they were kind of surprised when they first found that these were retroviruses. They thought they were going to be something else, um, different kinds of viruses. And in fact, there was a lot of discussion about whether these viruses actually cause disease. And we can talk more about that later, preferably over a few alcoholic beverages in terms of um, these particular viruses causing disease. Yeah. Um, these particular uh, group specific antigens. So it was really very much about those different proteins that are present in the actual virion, which is there. Yeah? Do each of these have specific oncogenes for each one that they upregulate? Or? Oh, these different ones? Yeah, they, these, these all have different oncogenes. We'll talk about the oncogenes um, a little bit in just a second, and what those on particular oncogenes are, and particularly for Rouse sarcoma virus. Um, SARC should actually sound really familiar for those of you who've had cell biology. Um, and we think we talked a little bit, a little bit in molecular as well. Um, there's this other set of viruses down here, um, the so-called spuma or foamy viruses. These are viruses that actually don't cause disease and were only found much later in terms of studying the retroviruses. But they've turned out to be incredibly useful in terms of looking at genomes and what kinds of retroviruses are present in genomes, and then being able to follow those back. It looks as if, you know, even though we just discovered them only a few tens of years ago, um, these viruses have probably been around for hundreds of millions of years, um, particularly these, these foamy viruses um, in particular. Um, the other thing to point out here, the Lenti viruses. Why are they called Lenti? because they're slow, um, slow disease causing. Um, and so that's the, the big difference with these um, lentiviruses, is that they're just slow disease causing. Okay, general retrovirus stuff, and then we'll um, get back and talk about HIV right at the end here. This is our classic virion cartoon. We've got an envelope around the outside with surface proteins, transmembrane proteins, matrix proteins, so SU, TM, MA. So this is everything that's in the envelope. Again, we talked about matrix. That's usually the one that's interacting with your nucleocapsid. Here, we'd have a spike, for instance, in some of those viruses, like the coronaviruses. We'd have HA in terms of the influenza viruses. Here, it's one protein, which is on the outside, and a separate transmembrane protein. I'll give you one guess what interacts with the receptor. Be this one right here. So the inside of these enveloped viruses has a regular capsid structure. And for the majority of those different virus families that we we're talking about, it's actually an icosahedral capsid. And so the HIVs, the lentiviruses, are really kind of the exception as far as that's concerned. A pretty regular icosahedral capsid varies a little bit from virus to virus, and not surprisingly, it's made up of the capsid protein. 
So uh, that's <clears throat> the capsid. Inside that capsid, you have the viral genome, which is, I've been beating over the head here, is a positive strand RNA. But one of the things you'll notice, there are actually two copies of this positive strand RNA here. And they are base paired to each other, close to the five prime end of the genome. And it turns out that's probably really important for the template switching we'll talk about from the replication um, a little bit later on. Already mentioned that they have tRNA genes that are the primers for replication. These tRNA genes are base paired to each of these genomes here. These are cellular tRNAs. It's not a virally encoded tRNA, it's a cellular tRNA that gets incorporated into the virus genome by association with it. And just like the case that we have with all of those negative strand RNA viruses where you have to have the polymerase protein, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase that comes in with the genome, all of these virions have to have the reverse transcriptase associated with them. Because remember, the only time you're getting transcription is once you've already gotten into the nucleus. So this RNA can't do anything until it's become DNA, but not only when it's become DNA, but also after it's been integrated into the genome. So that means you have to have not just the reverse transcriptase, but also the integrase enzyme, which is present here in the virion. So this is, again, not dissimilar to a lot of those negative strand RNA viruses. Lots of proteins have to be there when you actually come in with the virion inside the cell. Are they all viral like RNA? So those are, these are all viral proteins, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those, those two strands um, that are base paired to each other at one end are complementary. And of course, they can't be this way around. They've got to be that way around in order to form proper base pairs. But we always draw these as lines, but they're in fact, that little piece is anti-parallel. The way the rest of the genome is, it just so sort of seems to be flopping around inside the nucleocapsid. Yeah? You said they're base, they're base paired at the five prime end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not completely at the five prime end, but they're close to the five prime end. You'll notice there's a little, you know, tail up here as well. Yeah. So there's a base, just this base pairing interaction that happens between the two genomes. Okay. So what does this genome actually look like? And again, this is for the classic retroviruses. When we talk about the lentiviruses, it's a little bit of complication on top of it, but otherwise really very similar. These genomes that are packaged, remember there are two of them, have a cap, they have a tail, and eventually my pointer will work here, I hope. Um, a cap and a tail. Where do these caps and tails come from? Cellular transcription. So it's all the cellular machinery um, that makes this. This messenger RNA, which is also the genome, has another couple of things that are important as far as that replication is concerned in particular. There's a repeated sequence, R that's present at both the five prime end and the three prime end. And then we have unique sequence at the five prime end, U5, unique sequences at the three prime end. PBS, what the heck is PBS? It's not phosphate buffered saline. It's the primer binding site. That's the part which is complementary to the tRNA, which is being used as the primer. So here's our primer binding site. Then we have the five prime splice site and a three prime splice site. Not surprising, that's going to be where we get most of our splicing taking place. We already talked about the three genes, GAG, Paul, and ENV. These are subdivided into other proteins. Surface and transmembrane, we already talked about. Those are the ones that are sticking in the membrane. Matrix, nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is the protein that binds to the RNA. Capsid is the protein which is making the shell that's around the outside. Again, usually icosahedral for those that are not the lentiviruses. Then we have the Paul gene. The Paul gene is not just the reverse transcriptase. It also contains the integrase and this PR thing. What the heck does PR stand for? It's a protease. So why do you need a protease? Because these things, as is kind of hopefully obvious here, one big RNA. If you've got one big RNA, what does that mean about your proteins? 
Posit is polycystronic is one option, but what else? Polyproteins. So these are made as polyproteins. So again, hooking back way up, you know, way back when, what midterm was that again? Um, these things like the picoRNA viruses, which are all made as polyproteins, the flaviviruses, which are all made as polyproteins, and then getting chopped up by proteases. And in this case, it's all the viral protease that does this. So the Paul genes, uh, again, I don't like this nomenclature. It's really the enzymes which are involved in replication and replication in the broadest sense, going from the RNA to the DNA, integrating, and then also making the virion later on. In terms of the protease is also um, critical for cutting apart the matrix nucleocapsid and capsid. These are those main structural proteins, again, that are the group-specific antigens that you find there. So this is what the genome looks like. Yeah? What's the, the psi? What's the psi about? Thank you for reminding me. So the psi is a packaging signal. So it's a sequence in the RNA, which basically only seems to be important in terms of forming a secondary structure. That's what the nucleocapsid binds to. And just like we've seen with nucleocapsids in basically all of the other RNA viruses, once you have original binding, then you have cooperative binding that's going to bind to the rest of it, and that then will lead to packaging the genome. One thing you'll notice is that this psi sequence, or really structure, is three prime of this five prime splice site. What does that mean about splicing? If you have a spliced RNA, are you going to have that psi site in it? No. What does that mean about that particular RNA? Is that going to get packaged? No. So it's a wonderful mechanism, again, to totally over there the uh, that the virus has figured out how to make sure that only the full length genome gets packaged and not some of these spliced genomes, which are there. And you remember the, for some of the other genomes that we've talked about, the subgenomic <coughs> pieces, RNAs versus genome packaging. What was the difference there? Nucleocapsid binding. So if you had too much of the nucleocapsid, then you had whole genomes. If you had smaller amounts, you'd just be making the messenger RNA. Yeah, Chase. If you were to inhibit the psi activity, would that prevent genome packaging and virion maturation? OK, so the, the, the question is, if you could abrogate the psi activity, would you change replication? The psi is just a sequence. And so it's a sequence part of the genome, which forms a structure, and that's what interacts with nucleocapsid. So I'm not sure how you would <laughs> change the, the, the function of that. Uh, and it does seem to be pretty flexible. Um, you can have lots of changes and still get packaging taking place. OK, so <clears throat> this is a reminder that I did actually finally get the Flint et al. textbook on reserve in the library. Anybody going to look at it yet? No, um, but it is there. Um, these particularly, I think uh, it's a great textbook, talks about lots of different things, but probably the most important are the appendices at the very end because they go over various different virus life cycles in exactly this form. So this is the one for retrovirus replication. You have binding to receptors on the plasma membrane. Again, this would be the surface protein that interacts with the receptors. You have fusion at the plasma membrane, and the capsid is released. In this capsid, you've got the reverse transcriptase and your genomes. So the reverse transcriptase actually has activity in the capsid. So if you give capsids DNTPs, so deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates, it will make DNA copies of the genome. Um, and that's, in fact, how Temin and Baltimore did their studies, published them in 77, um, got the Nobel Prize soon thereafter. So in this capsid, you have activity of the reverse transcriptase. This then makes a double-stranded DNA that we'll talk about, again, how that works in just a second. Then this double-stranded DNA somehow has to get into the nucleus. Now, there are two different ways that this happens. Um, lentiviruses, again, like the HIVs, uh, are really good at taking this and putting it into the nucleus even of non-dividing cells. Most retroviruses, though, actually have to wait for the nuclear membrane to be degraded. They have to wait for replication to be happening 
in these cells. Because this double-stranded DNA, together with the integrase, the intosome, again, all these molecular biologists love to call stuff zomes, nucleotides plus protein, this is way too big to get into the nucleus by itself. So it's either have to have a specific mechanism for doing that. Again, the lentiviruses do this, but most of the other retroviruses don't. Once it gets into the nucleus, now it can integrate, apparently randomly, as far as we can tell, into the host genome. Now it's in the host genome. It gets transcribed. These messenger RNAs get exported. They get translated into various different proteins. Turns out different amounts of these proteins. A lot more of the gag protein, a lot less of the gag pol protein. Okay, how does that happen? Frame shifting. Get back to that a little bit later on as well. You have these other messenger RNAs, particularly the ones that get spliced, again, the 5' splice site and the 3' splice site. Those make the envelope proteins. These then get directed to the plasma membrane. Your genome has been transcribed into RNA. Now it hasn't been spliced because you've got that packaging signal in it. That then associates with your nucleocapsid, brings it out to the membrane. You have budding that takes place. But one of the really interesting things about all these retroviruses, this budding takes place. This virion's not infectious. It only becomes infectious if you have activity of the protease, which actually chops up some more of these proteins in order to give you a final infectious state. And it's because of these polyproteins. When this gets assembled, it's actually assembled as a polyprotein and then is in fact not active. The polymerase, the integrase, uh, sorry, the reverse transcriptase, et cetera, is not active until it gets cleaved. That cleavage actually takes place out here on the outside. Yeah? Are there ways to specifically inhibit this protein? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in fact, some of the uh, retroviral therapies, in fact, some of the currently used HIV therapies have protease inhibitors um, in them, and that's one of the main things that people are using. Um, for antiretroviral drugs. Okay, replication. <coughs> this is the fun part, well, at least as far as I'm concerned, about all of these retroviruses. So we already talked about the primer binding site and the tRNA primer that we have up here right near to the 5' prime end of the genome. But wait a sec. This primer is like it's an OH. It's going in completely the wrong direction. That's bizarre, but again, remember, it's a positive strand, and if you're going to be binding to it, it's going to be the opposite orientation. So the base pairing happens there. So we have a tRNA primer binding to the binding site. We've got this RNA template. The reverse transcriptase will use this OH, copy this template out here to the end. Okay, this is not copied your whole genome yet. And this is, by the way, so all the black is RNA and the orange is going to be DNA. So reverse transcribes out to the end of the genome, gives you the complement of this repeat sequence, and then the complement of the U5 sequence right here. Um, this is what's called the minus strand strong stop DNA. Um, this is just if you purify, again, these are happening all in the capsids. You can purify capsids. You'll find a lot of mostly RNA and a little tiny bit of DNA here. Then. RNAs H, what does RNAs H do? It's an RNAs that degrades RNA and RNA DNA hybrids, will chew up the RNA here. Now you've got a single stranded piece, which has a complement, most importantly, to this repeated sequence. I'll remember, of course, that there's a repeated sequence down here at the three prime end of the genome. Now, this is always shown as being on the same RNA. It's probably at least as likely that this happens on the other RNA. It's really hard to show whether this is the case or not. But you remember these two RNAs are right next to each other. And so instead of having to go from one end to the other of that same RNA, it's quite possible it's doing it on the opposite RNA. But again, it's this complementary sequence to the repeat, which now allows this part to loop over and find the opposite end of the genome. Now. We're in great shape, just a sec. Uh, you've got a 3 prime OH. You've got this wonderful template. The reverse transcriptase cruises all the way down to the opposite end. Yes? Uh, Sorry. 
Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but maybe I'll just restate what I, I talked about before. So hopefully that will help. So um, here, it's shown as this tRNA, yeah. which is just extended right here, which has you know, it's a tRNA that's got a DNA piece hanging off of it. Here it's shown that it's basically looped around to the same genome, because there are two copies of the genome oh, which are there. Step three, yeah. Right, so this step three, is this looping around to this same genome, or is it jumping over to the other genome, which is there? So that's, that's the, the thing here. Yeah, and, and if it's, this is complicated enough with just one genome. If we had two, it would be even crazier. So um, again, so we've replicated our way all the way down, reverse transcribed all the way down to the opposite end. Now we've got a complete genome copied in DNA with a little bit of extra stuff down here at the end. There's also now a three prime OH here on the RNA, which allows the reverse transcriptase to go here up to the other end. And what happens here is this actually ends up running into a specific change nucleotide in the tRNA, pseudouridine. So all tRNAs are modified, heavily modified. Some of the modifications are pseudouridine, which is this funky uracil that gets flipped on its head. Um, that doesn't base pair to anything. So the reverse transcriptase gets there and it stops. At the same time, there's also the RNA-SH activity, which is very carefully chewing away at all of this RNA, which is in the RNA-DNA duplex, with one little tiny exception. And that's this, what's called this PPT, the polypurine tract. So it's a bunch of purines all together. Turns out it's more resistant to being degraded by RNA-SH than the <clears throat> other nucleotides which are there. That's the primer which goes out to this pseudouridine, but eventually it can't survive any longer and gets chewed up, as well as the tRNA getting chewed up. Because again, this is an RNA-DNA hybrid, so that gets chewed up. Now we've got a partially double-stranded DNA with a primer binding site at one end. But you remember we have our complement of the primer binding site over here. So this, again, can loop around. It could be looping back to the same template or, again, the different one. And gives you a 3'OH, a template, a 3'OH, and a template. And in this process generates these LTRs the long terminal repeats. So the unique sequence that was at the three prime end is now at the five prime end. And the unique sequence was just at the five prime end is also at the three prime end. And that's because of all of this template switching that's going back and forth. So you end up copying this piece that was present here at the beginning, fusing it to that piece and giving you two copies. Yeah. Okay, so right what comes into the cell, here is your three prime end, you know, the R sequence right here. So that's that original three prime end. There's unique sequence that's present at the three prime end in the RNA which is made, and there's unique sequence at the five prime end. And that's just the RNA that comes in as part of the genome. And then those get copied into DNA, and you've got two copies, one at each end. Yes, no, huh. Um, I've tried really hard actually to find a decent animation of this unsuccessfully. If anyone finds one, please share it with me. So is it circularizing when it, I mean, the template overhangs or attacks the other end? Is that what's going on? So the, the question now, Alice's question is, um, are we, is it circularizing? So is it literally this piece here, which will loop around to the other end? or is it going to the other strand? And the answer is probably yes. <laughs> so both. Um, there's evidence for these circular intermediates, but there's also evidence for hooked up end-to-end -end intermediates. But you always are going to end up with this structure at the end. 
Um, and there's another diagram of this, again, in the Flint textbook that goes through those circular intermediates as well. So if you want to look at that there, um, that's also there. Yeah? Going back a little bit, but I saw in the diagram that you always package two reverse uh, transcriptases, or it looks like it. There were two okay. reverse transcriptase molecules. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that so? I mean, it seems like it would be so that you have one for each strand to be copied simultaneously. I didn't actually prime him for this, really. <laughs> so um, there are multiple copies of reverse transcriptase um, in the virion, and that's because these are basically DNA polymerases. What's the big problem with DNA polymerases? A, they need a primer. That's one thing. What else? They're not processive, exactly. They fall off all the time. And if you don't have good proofreading activity, they make a bunch of mistakes. Um, and so that actually gets back to here. Um, these are quite low fidelity proteins. So they introduce a lot of errors when they're replicating. And because of this introduction of errors, you're replicating, it depends on the genome here, but this is some seven to 10 KB of RNA that's being replicated here. So you end up with lots of changes and this is Partly why HIV is such a problem is because you have huge numbers of changes that happen in the genome. And because of that change, the sequences of the proteins that are present on the outside that the immune system is trying to deal with. And so that can be a real issue. What this means is that, we haven't actually talked about quasi species, I think, before, uh, that when you have a cell producing a bunch of virions, all those virions have slightly different sequences in them. And so when people talk about a species, usually you say you've got one genome sequence. Here, it's a whole population of genome sequences. And so this generates what people also call quasi-species um, in terms of looking at these genomes. But getting back to reverse transcriptase. Oh, is there a question? Sorry, I'm gonna stretch here. Uh, lots of copies in the genome. Um, again, it can work in the virion itself, particularly in the capsid. It's an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, yes, but also, you remember back to here, it's also a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, because here it's using a DNA template. Here it's using a DNA template. So it's both an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. Turns out it also has DNA helicase activity for separating the two strands relative to each other. And then where the heck does that RNA H come from? Usually RNA-H is present in the nucleus. That's where you need it when you can get rid of primers, right? Well, where's all this replication happening? Out in the virion. So that RNA-H turns out has to be part of, and it is actually part of the reverse transcriptase, which serves as both a endo and exo nuclease. So it chops in the middle and at the ends of RNAs that are in RNA DNA hybrids. Yeah. Is there some kind of DNTP importer in the capsid? Doesn't seem to be, interestingly enough. And so, as, as you would, it gets, we just said, now how do you get all of these ribonucleotides and actually deoxyribonucleotides into the capsid in order to get this replication taking place? Uh, it's actually really interesting. There doesn't seem to be a particular one. And I'll back up here a little bit more. But uh, on the cartoon here, you may notice this little dotted lines here that are present around the outside. It does seem there's a little bit of degradation that happens to the capsid, and that's probably where they just come in through diffusion. But yeah, there's no specific transporter. There's also no ribonucleotide reductase, which is what you would expect, and that's what we saw with some of the pox viruses, for instance. Here you don't see that. Could you hide that from the insert of the nucleus? Um, here it doesn't seem to be. It just seems to be pure diffusion that's happening. Yeah, Ian. Um, mine was about quasi-species. So yeah talked about how these particles don't become infectious until they, until, until after they've, they've butted off mm -hmm. from the cell, um, if the protease activity happens. And quasi-species, I mean, if you're getting fluctuations in the, in the genome, um, is that, do those two things give you like a decreased chance of actually producing a successful infectious particle? Yeah, so yeah, that, let's paraphrase your question here, but if you're making all these mistakes and you've got to do all this protease stuff, 
wouldn't this be incredibly inefficient <laughs> and have very low number of infectious virus particles? That turns out to be exactly the case for these retroviruses. Many, many, many of them are non-infectious. So if you do, again, rewind all the way back, you know, retro class here, back to I think it was lecture two, um, where we were talking about PFUs per virion ratio, these retroviruses are some of the worst. So you've got tons of virions and very little infectivity. So um, that's exactly true. So there are, there are very few of those. So what does the reverse transcriptase look like? Obviously, DNA polymerase, right? Um, so it looks <coughs> very similar to the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from polio. This is just the reverse transcriptase. Again, it's this right hand structure with a thumb, palm, and fingers. Um, and just indication, again, it's a DNA polymerase like it needs a primer. It's not highly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, processive. It doesn't have any extra proofreading domains. So, you know, I'll not terribly surprise. There's one other thing to mention here, and that's this extra RNase H um, domain at the back here. So, this is the big difference relative to those other polymerases, actually bringing along an RNase H domain with it um, as it's doing this replication process. So now we have double-stranded DNA with LTRs at either end. This is great and wonderful, but nothing can happen until this gets into the nucleus, nucleus excuse me, and gets inserted into the host genome. How does that happen? The integrase protein. The integrase protein interacts with the LTRs, long terminal repeats at either end, and this is Again, a pretty random sequence here. This is just shown as, you know, GGG, CCC, but it could be really any sequence here. Uh, these, the integrase chews in the ends a little bit of these LTRs. Now, at first you think chewing in the end of your genome is a bad idea, but remember, this is a copy. So these are extra copies at the end of either of your genome. So chews in a little bit, then cuts this host sequence, gives a couple of gaps. Those gaps get filled in. This is a lot like what happens with transposons. You end up with short direct repeat sequences that are present on the outside of your integrated genome, in this case your provirus genome, and these then get filled in. Now you've got your so-called proviral DNA. We talked about prophage before with lambda integrates into the genome. The provirus is now this retrovirus that's been inserted into the um, genome. It's actually a pretty good video for the integration process, um, which is here on YouTube. Um, recommend taking a look at it in terms of these ends and the end pieces and filling in at the ends. It's actually pretty horrible for the replication process. So that part is, is pretty good. So any questions on replication before we do a clicker question? No. Good, okay. This should hopefully be straightforward. We're gonna try and get 100%, right? 100% from here on in? Good, okay. The primer for the positive strand of retrovirus replication is a tRNA, a protein, the PPT, a cellular primer, the genome itself. So remember, it's a positive strand which is being packaged. You need to make a, another positive strand. So it's a key concept, right? The key concept is the TNA primer for the negative strand. Because it binds to the positive strand of the genome. 
Depends on your point of view, whether it's a trick question or not. So, yes, for the negative strand it is, but not for the positive strand. So it's the PPT, yes. That nasty trick question guy. That, that, I didn't mean it to be a trick question, really. I didn't. Didn't you, though? No, I did. I really didn't. Trust me. Hey, hey, hey. No. <laughs> okay, so um, let's... <clears throat> Okay, that's, again, the important part, again, is this whole replication business. And apparently I didn't do a very good job of explaining positive versus negative strand, uh, as far as that's concerned. So uh, once we have our genome inserted into the host, now it's all cellular processes. Those cellular processes <coughs> are going to generate your messenger RNAs and also your genomes. Turns out that these LTRs are also really, really good promoters. So they're great at binding the RNA polymerase and getting <coughs> transcription to start there. Caps again, formed by normal cellular processes. The start at transcription is right next to that repeat sequence. And then goes through to this other repeat sequence. And then there's a poly A tail signal, which is right after that repeat sequence. There's also a poly A tail um, right here repeat after this repeat sequence. So you make a bunch of shorter RNAs, again, that are non-productive. Uh, making the polyprotein, again, this is made mostly. You have the GAG proteins, again, matrix capsid, nucleic capsid. And in some cases, you'll also have it extended through these polymerase genes. Again, this is all of those enzymes, protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. Or you have splicing, the main 5' splice site and 3' splice site, and end up with all of these envelope proteins. Again, this is now an RNA which is missing that little psi sequence which is present in there as well. So um, how do we get frame shifting? Turns out there are two different ways that you have frame shifting that takes place in different retroviruses. In the case of HIV, it's a RNA secondary structure, which causes the ribosome to slip a little bit and end up with a different open reading frame. Um, you also have some retroviruses which just suppress termination. So you have a stop codon. Sometimes that stop codon is just misread. But what this means is the majority of the time, as we saw in that cartoon of the replication at the beginning, Mostly you have the GAG proteins, and you have a lot fewer of the gag paul fusion proteins, which makes perfect sense. You don't need as much of those enzymes as you do of all of the structural proteins. And so this is how that is actually being regulated. So two different ways, either suppression of termination or some kind of secondary structure that causes a frame shift to take place. Once you have these proteins being made, we've got our gag proteins, our Paul proteins, our N proteins. All of these are fusion proteins. So even the one that gets spliced, ENV is TM and SU. So that needs to get cleaved again by the viral protease. The gag proteins, I should say this is the polyprotein should be here, gets localized to the plasma membrane because it gets modified with a fatty acid residue. And those, these are fatty acids which will then target this polyprotein to the plasma membrane. Um, that happens on the matrix protein. So if you think about how these are being put together, you've got matrix nucleocapsid capsid, all is one protein, that gets stuck to the membrane through this modified matrix protein here. That's then also linked to the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. And only later, the very end here, is this protease actually active. And we talked about the psi sequence before. Nucleocapsid is going to bind to the psi sequence, again, only if it's in a non-spliced form. Great. We know, I know everything about these retroviruses, how they replicate, how they form, et cetera, how you're getting functioning. But how the heck do they form tumors? Where are those tumor genes? What are those cell cycle regulators that we talked about with all those DNA um, tumor viruses? 
the answer is they're all present in the cells. And where those come from are when you have this random integration that takes place in the host genome. It's a, a pretty random integration. And then you have transcription that takes place. That transcript then gets packaged into virions that can then go off and find other cells to infect. In a few cases, these viruses happen to have integrated right next to cellular oncogenes. Those then get transcribed as part of the virus transcript. That then gets assembled into an infectious virion, and now that virion moves and puts an oncogene into a cell that otherwise would be you know, getting infected by a retrovirus, but wouldn't then turn into this cancerous development. So all of these tumor-causing RNA viruses have picked up a cellular oncogene. And in that process, are now bringing that cellular oncogene to a new cell, and that's what's causing the cancers to take place. And the first of these to be found, again, was the Rouse sarcoma virus, um, which picked up this <coughs> SARC protein. And the very first ever oncogene to be found was, again, this um, SARC protein from Rouse sarcoma virus. It was only later that they showed that this was, in fact, a cellular protein that had been picked up by this retrovirus. But it's all because of the way that these retroviruses function. They're transcribing. If they happen to be in a genome, which has a oncogene right next to it, and we're making a whole bunch of changes because the reverse transcriptase is pretty low fidelity. You may have knocked out the poly-A tail site. You end up transcribing through the poly-A tail of that oncogene, and boom, now you've got a virus which actually has this oncogene, which is part of it. So that's where all of these tumor viruses come from. Yeah? You said it's nonspecific. It seems to be pretty nonspecific. So this is, these are rare events. Right. They're really very rare events that take place. But there are enough of these retroviruses around. And we know that there are so many of them around because we just look at our own genome. It's loaded with these things. So um, we've already talked about this a little bit, um, certainly in molecular last term. Um, endogenous proviruses and um, clear retrotransposons that are virus-derived. They've got GAG, they've got Paul. some of them even have ENV. That's 8% of our genome, way more than our individual protein coding genes. So huge amount of our genome is these, and basically retrovirus, and people have done this now. They've actually tweaked a few of the nucleotides in these endogenous retroviruses and made them into infectious viruses. Um, there are, none of them are infectious now, but some of them can be made infectious really quite easily. Um, so huge amount of our genome are these, these viruses. You also have retrotransposons and these retrosequences, lines and signs, which actually have quite different sequences, but they still are going through this reverse transcription um, kind of, of state. And we're not going to spend too much time talking about those. But these viruses, um, basically LTR, GAG, Paul, ENV, LTR, large numbers in our genomes. And that's probably why a lot of these viruses turned out to be tumor-causing viruses, because we got so many of these things. And so many of these things have been around, clearly, for literally hundreds of millions of years. OK, so now I'll have a clicker question before, actually, after I ask you this question, that hopefully everyone's going to get 100% on. Pardon? How do you make a copy? How do these endogenous retroviruses get stuck in our genome? Great question. We don't know. Um, probably it's just we've been exposed, and then they've been uh, endogenized into the genome. There's a really cool story, actually kind of a frightening story, about koalas in Australia, which are actually endogenizing some retroviruses right now um, as we speak. They're picking up in their genome. It's just sort of spreading through, spreading through the country. OK, so everyone's going to get this right, I hope. Why are only complete genomes packaged in retroviruses? Due to frame shifting, the absence of oncogenes, genomes are only packaged together with cellular tRNA, two copies of the genome have to pair, the packaging site is between splice sites. 
And I won't tell you if it's a cl uh, trick question because I never do trick questions, at least not on purpose. <laughs> I should, I, should, I should own the trick question? Uh, she says, they're not trick questions. I'm just trying to get you to think critically. <laughs> Don't make me think. Actually, you're paying to think, right? Isn't that what all school's about? <laughs> I don't know what I think. <laughs> See? 100%. Yes, and it is the correct answer. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to cheer one of these days when it's the wrong answer. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, since I normalized, that wouldn't make any difference. See, that prediction would actually be thrown out. So. OK, so um, 10 minutes to talk about HIV. Oh, this is great. Um, so I'm not going to talk actually at all about disease, and we'll skip over this. I'm going to talk about the fascinating molecular aspects of HIV that has nothing to do with disease. So we'll skip over this, uh, and we'll talk about the interesting structural proteins, which are different. Um, major capsid, nucleotapsid, protease, reverse transcriptic integrase, structural protein, TM, all the same, except for this um, VPR down here at the bottom. Uh, the structure, this is the part that I think is really fascinating, is not an obvious icosahedron. It's this strange fullerene cone structure, but otherwise everything else is exactly the same. This fullerene cone structure is really fascinating because basically what it is is two different sized icosahedra with different T numbers at either end of a structure. So it's basically one icosahedron at this end with one T number, an icosahedron with the other T number at the opposite end that are fused with these hexameric subunits in between. And it's really like archaeoviruses too, I think. Is but These, these, the, all the, the hexamers, yeah. yeah, it does seem to be somewhat helical, but that's just sort of just the packaging of these um, individual hexons together with each other. They're just basically they're fused together with these, these proteins that are in between. It's all going to be the capsid proteins. It's all capsid protein. And again, you know, the quasi equivalents, you know, five and six fold axes. Um, you always have to have 12 of these five-fold axes, and then you have the six-fold axes that are sticking between them. So the HIV-1 genome, is true for all of the lentiviruses, is generally just the same, gag, pol, and end, but it's got these extra proteins that are really tucked inside these. So these are overlapping open reading frames. It should sound really familiar now. We've seen quite a few of them already. Uh, but these are generated through alternative splicing. So really briefly, binding and entry, you've probably all heard about this, HIV, these infect immune system cells. Most people end up dying from AIDS, not because of the HIV infection, but some secondary infection because their immune systems are shot. Um, and the way that this happens um, is the CD4 protein, which is on the outside of T cells, binds to this surface protein. Then you have a co-receptor, which is CCR5. You have to have both of these receptors in order to get infection. The reason I mention this is that there are certain members of the population that don't have a CCR5 gene. They seem to be perfectly happy, and in fact, they're even more happy because they can't get infected by these HIV. Um, and in fact, you've probably heard about some of these people, you know, the Berlin patient, for instance, who've been HIV-free even though they've been exposed for long periods of time, lacking in this um, CCR5 gene. Yeah? Do we know of downside to people not having this? I mean, why wouldn't we 
knock, knock out the gene, use CRISPR, and knock out the gene in everyone. Um, people are actually talking about trying to do that, um, more having to do with blood transfusions. And so the Berlin patient got a blood transfusion, turns out from CCR5 minus, and people are trying actually to do that. So um, the only other thing I wanted to mention here is that was that one structural protein that was different, VPR. That allows these lentiviruses to get into the nucleus without degradation of the nuclear membrane. And so remember, the integrase with the genome, double-stranded DNA, can't get in unless you have the membrane breakdown. But in the case of HIV, these lentiviruses, it actually can get in. The big difference in HIV-1 versus these other retroviruses are the non-structural proteins. And we're mostly going to talk about these two right here. The TAT, it's a little hard to tell. These are the boldface TAT here, the transactivator of transcription, and REV, regulator of expression of virion proteins. So what does TAT do? It's a transactivator of transcription. Great. But it's not a classic transcriptional activator or <coughs> enhancer binding protein loops over, helps to get the polymerase to bind to the promoter. TAT works as an anti-terminator. Should sound really familiar based on that other virus we talked about before. Um, basically, what it does is it interacts with a structure in the RNA. And this is the TAR RNA, because the TAT-associated RNA. That then, with TAT and cellular proteins, the names here are not important, which is why I'm not mentioning them, um, those then allow the polymerase to get past this otherwise termination point and to transcribe the rest of the viral, proviral, I should say, genome. Absence of TAT, very little transcription. Presence of TAT, lots of long transcripts that take place. The other protein that I wanted to mention in particular is this REV protein. REV is also made by alternative splicing here in the genome, very similar to the TAT protein, the REV protein is basically a RNA export protein. What it does is it will bind to a, again, incredibly creatively named REV response element, so a RNA sequence that's present in the genome, and take that out into the cytoplasm and allow it to be packaged in terms of a virion. So making all of these processes, you can only make REV from spliced. This REV response element is actually normally spliced out of the genome, and it's spliced out to make the REV protein. So you only are going to be transporting that RNA out to the cytoplasm and getting it packaged through the psi sequence, which we just saw a second ago. I'll get 100% on. Um, and that then allows it to be packaged. So we've got splicing control based on all retroviruses, again, the psi sequence, and <clears throat> splicing control for HIV, which is this REV protein that helps us get outside of the nucleus. I'm not going to talk about these other proteins, which means they're not going to be on the exam. Um, just the very last thing, and this is getting back to your protease question, how do we treat HIV right now? We bash it with a whole bunch of different drugs, some of which are protease inhibitors, but most of them are reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So um, it's a combination therapy going after multiple different, usually enzymatic activities, um, which are present here. So integrase inhibitors, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and protease inhibitors. So with that, um, wish you a good weekend, and we'll talk about algal viruses and archaeal viruses next week. And then we'll have an exam.